Patrick Bellow ve Sayın Susan Rolf'u dinleyeceğiz. 2011 yılında İngiltere'de yılın yapı servisleri danışmanlığı firması seçilen, son 20 yıldır sürdürülebilir yapı teknoloji, teknolojileri alanında hizmet veren Atölye Ten, Atölye Ten'in kurucu ortağı, yüksek çevre mühendisi Patrick Bellow'u, karınca yuvalarından labirentlere sürdürülebilir mimarlık için mühendislik başlıklı sunumunu yapmak üzere sahneye davet ediyorum. Thank you. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, great pleasure to be here in Istanbul, causing feedback on the sound system already. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work that we've done over the last 20 years in, in green buildings. But before I get on to projects, I just wanted to have a, to more of a general spiel about, about sustainability. And I hope that you'll... Um, I don't know how many of you are listening in on translation. Um, not many by the looks of it, so many of you speak English. I do speak rather quickly, so if I'm going too fast, if everyone does that or something, I'll um, calm me down a bit. The, um, the pr our practice was founded 20 years ago. We're based mainly in London, but we, we have a few offices around the world. I was lucky enough to start teaching at Yale University 10 years ago. Um, and from my work at Yale, we've um, actually d developed a number of offices around the United States, um, working intensively on LEED buildings. We've built uh, 20 LEED Platinum buildings, um, about 50 or 60 LEED Gold buildings, um, and we're very, very involved in the kind of the movement towards uh, better benchmarking, about which much has been said this morning. Um, I sense here that things are slightly different in the way that you procure buildings. In a conversation, I'm working a lot with uh, an old uh, university friend of mine. I, I was fortunate to train in a joint school of architecture and engineering back in Bath in the 1970s and 80s, I'll say late 70s, early 80s. And one of my collaborators from that, um, uh, that period is, is an architect here in, uh, in Istanbul, Selçuk Avci. So Selçuk has been instrumental in us coming to work out here. Um, and when we trained together, we trained as architect and engineer, structural engineer, working collaboratively. And um, the, the slightly odd image on the screen behind me is, is, evokes a, an essay that was written in 1958, uh, 1959, by a guy called Lennon Reed. And it's called I Pencil. And this predates iPad and iPod, and it's all about the humble pencil. And what, he, what Leonard Reed says in, in, uh, in, his, in his paper is that nobody on the planet could make one of these on their own if they had no other resources. When you think about what's involved in making even the simplest object in terms of uh, mining the graphite, making the machinery that can mine the graphite and process the graphite, turn it into a perfect cylinder, the machinery to cut down a tree to make it into the shape that it is, the machinery to paint to make the brass ring that goes on the end and the rubber. This involves thousands of people in a process working collaboratively. So it's, when you think about a building in the con in a, in a, as an extension of this and the complexity of a building, it sometimes seems strange that the uh, clients are happy to give or hand the, uh, that task to a singular hand, to the architect. And most of the architects that we work with believe passionately in collaboration as the way to better buildings and better architecture. And if you look at the pace of change, how things change across time in different industries to construction, Here's an example from 1903, the very first flight, a, a machine made of paper and string, pretty much, that flew, made the first flight for the Wright brothers. And only 66 years later, Concorde flew supersonically. And it did that through the power of collaborative minds. It did it through many hundreds and thousands of, of people focusing on a single task. It's a luxury we don't have in the construction industry because nobody can really afford to spend that much time on every single project. But in the same way as building an aeroplane, is a complex task, so building a building is a complex task, and it should fall to more than really the, the, the, the architect to, to deal with that. Now, you can take other examples. Telephony is an even more recent example. I was very proud when I had my first mobile phone about 25 years ago. You'd carry this great big brick around with you and think you were really in touch with the world. And of course now, uh, the iPad, this is actually out of date because iPad have launched another one now, but that's the old iPad. The, the amount of communications that you can, you can be, the, the, the amount of um, equipment we have for communication is astonishing. And even to the point now where you can get biodegradable bamboo phones that are entirely disposable. How good is that? So there's, there's the pace of change in various different technologies. But at the same time, in the 20th century, a rather curious thing happened in buildings. Here's a, an image of, of, um, from the 1920s of, um, uh, it's called uh, Madison Park in New York, right next to our office. Well, our office is just down the street here, down Broadway. 
And what you notice from this image from 1920s is that all of the windows on these buildings, this is the famous Flatiron building, and this is just the building surrounding, all the windows have, sh have blinds shading them from the sun. If you look at that same building today, the Flatiron building today, and it's quite hard to pick it out, but here, what you see in place of blinds are air conditioners. So they took the blinds off and put air conditioners on, and that's our progress in the last 80 years in, in construction. And shame on us for that in many ways, shame on America for that. But that's kind of, in a sense, is a strange parallel, isn't it? We've gone pretty much nowhere in a, in a very long period. Now, if you look at what makes change happen in, through the world, what you see here is the, the beginnings of, the, of what's perceived as the modern movement in architecture. Um, there were a series of technological innovations that allowed this to happen. Uh, the ability to decouple the facade, the glass facade, from the frame of the building, which meant that you could make very light skins. So the engineer was challenged instead not uh, how to make, keep a building warm, but how much cooling he could deliver into a building to keep it comfortable by making the, glass, the building fully transparent. The elevator obviously allowed vertical movement in buildings, but it was principally the invention of air conditioning by Willis Carrier in 1923 or so that liberated the industry to, for us to build basically um, buildings that don't perform well in terms of carbon. And that was perpe has been perpetuated to the point of absurdity in some fields of architecture. Now this is a, an image of, a, of a, a uh, basically an archive in, um, in Paris. It's, the, it's a book archive uh, principally. So this, this building pretty much houses books. Now if you think pragmatically about a window or about glass, what does it, what does it do? It lets light in, it lets a view out, and it, lets, uh, and it basically provides um, a heat flow across the surface. But when did you ever meet a book that needed either a good view or plenty of daylight? So books don't need it. So to, to store books in a glass box is so fundamentally crazy that this, this, you kind of wonder what's happened to the world when these things happen. And it's, one has to be much more pragmatic, I think, about application of glass. The other thing that you know, this thing about transparency produces is some weird things. As, you, as, this is, as I ride around London, I take photographs of strange glass, glass facades. This is um, a building that's enigmatically titled Parliament View Apartments. And whenever you go past it, all of the windows are completely sealed off from the incredibly bright southwesterly sun that's streaming in. And so nobody ever gets a view out because they're always trying to keep the sun out of their building. This is um, ITN's building in London by Norman Foster, <clears throat> where the blinds are always down because of the, the glare on the screens they can't cope with. So the cost of, of keeping this building conditioned because of the glass is enormous, and yet the glass doesn't do its fundamental job, letting daylight in and letting a view out. And the other thing that you do see a lot in buildings is the blinds opening, reve you know, coyly revealing the rubbish behind the window, which is always a, a good thing, I think, in an office building. So glass, glass, beautiful glass, yes, but you've got to moderate it. And certainly in this part of the world, it's a huge issue how you balance passive gain against, against excessive heat gain in the summer months. So sustainability, what do we mean by sustainability? You probably hear, I'm sure, as you, as you do sustainability projects and read books about it, there's one definition that always comes to the fore, which is what's called the Brundtland definition. This lady here is um, Mrs. Brundtland. She was the Prime Minister of Norway, uh, who was um, employed by the United Nations to develop her paper, Our Common Future, in 1987. And her de definition was meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that basically says, as long as we don't screw the world up too much, it's sort of okay. Which actually isn't what I think a modern interpretation of sustainability should be. And I understand that um, Mr. Brundtland is now currently rewriting this for the United Nations in a more modern way. And the more modern way is to think about how can you be sustaining as well as just merely more sustainable. How can actually buildings and projects and environments and landscapes contribute to an improving world, not just a less destructive world. Um, one of my favourite definitions of sustainability and was, was coined by Buckminster Fuller, a uh, great theorist, a man whose books are wonderful but extremely hard to read. Um, but he did, he was one of the first people to coin the phrase sustainability and he defined it as doing more with less and as he built his ever more uh, light structures. Um, it was incredible, it's incredible how uh, prescient he was, how, how far ahead he saw the problems that we now have as a, as a society. So if you want a, a good read, read, read some Bucky Fuller. Excuse me, let's get some water. Um, this ne next little section is I've kept fairly short because I, I think um, it, it's something that you often see in environmental 
um, books and environmental tomes about learning from the vernacular, which means learning from the history of architecture, learning for how, from how other people build buildings. And I just wanted to put in two particularly good examples of vernacular building. One is the igloo. Now, the igloo is a, a building, a construction, that would never probably get a BRIAM or a LEED rating, but is almost perfectly climate adapted. It uses locally sourced materials, um, and the, the Eskimo packs the gaps between the ice blocks that he cuts from very close to his home uh, with water, which freezes to ice to reduce infiltration, stops the flow of air and reduces the flow of air. He orientates the igloo into the prevailing wind, but builds a series of buffer spaces and deflectors to make the air pass over the top of the igloo to minimize uh, heat, heat uh, airflow and, and, and heat, heat gain, sorry, uh, cold air coming into the space. He drapes the, um, the various passageways with animal skins to reduce infiltration of cold air. But most importantly, he drapes the inside of the igloo with more animal skins. And that shows a fundamental understanding of radiative heat exchange. So he's lying here on a sleeping platform uh, when it's minus 40 degrees centigrade outside. And because of this um, low emissivity insulating surface, the skin between him and the ice, his body doesn't see the surface temperature of the ice, his body sees the surface temperature of this low emission material. So by uh, reducing the radiative heat transfer, <clears throat> his, he can sleep at around about zero degrees centigrade, which is chilly, I'll admit, but it's survivable when it's 40 below outside. So there's a, whole, a clear understanding of convective heat flow, conductive heat flow, and radiative heat flow, which again is part of the basic toolkit of environmental design. You have to understand these different ways that heat flows in a building. <clears throat> if you're really going to attack um, uh, these, sorts of, these sorts of issues. And of course, uh, you see in other areas of vernacular architecture, this is just one example, there are many, many more. The, the use of, of uh, wind towers, wind scoops, uh, an architecture that's very much driven by the environment, as opposed to the architecture that we now all too often perpetuate, which is not driven by environment at all, but is driven much more by a, a, an architectural um, sense rather than an environmental one. My favorite uh, environmental engineers are the termites. Now, termites are creatures that are about an inch long. They're completely blind, and they've had no architectural training whatsoever. And they build these most amazing structures. They build these structures that are maybe four or five meters high. And this is the nest of what's called the compass or magnetic termite in Aust from Australia. Now, these guys build these huge nests to maximize the stack effect, so natural ventilation inside the nest. Um, they, the shape of the nest with this very precise orientation. So there's a side-on view showing that they have a very broad face facing east and west to pick up the sun early in the morning and late in the afternoon. But at the middle of the day, they present a very thin edge to the hot sun, so they don't heat up, the nest doesn't heat up too much in the middle part of the day. They, um, just moving on now to an African termite, this is the Macrotermes bellicosus. The African, this is probably the, the smartest animal of all, as far as I can make out. They, the queen who lives in the center of a nest likes to be kept at precisely 30 to 31 degrees centigrade. And the animals in the nest control the temperature by blocking and unblocking these holes in the structure with mud. So they're like volume control dampers that open and close the nest structure to let the air up and down. Now as they open, the, if, if they're getting too uh, hot and they want to cool down, they open these holes up and air is drawn in through earth, these tubes out to the earth and through these, into, through these um, porous side walls down into an underground chamber. The underground chamber being a meter below ground is cooler than the, the air that's coming in, it cools it down. And then you get a radiation effect, uh, sorry, an evaporation effect as the moisture from the nest runs down and evaporates to provide more cooling. When it gets really hot, the workers uh, have been seen to take a seed pod or a piece of leaf and they head off down to the water table, sometimes 30, 40 meters below ground. They pick up a droplet of water and bring it right back up to the surface, tip it into this chamber and go all the way back down again to get some more. Now, obviously, there's a limit to how far you can take this metaphor with clients and their workers, because you can't have people walking around with buckets of water trying to keep the building cool. However, what you are seeing here is an understanding of evaporation and evaporative cooling, which is also something we can learn about in the climate of Turkey, I'm sure. This um, amazing structure underground here is um, these radial fins. David Attenborough, in his, in his um, show Life on Earth, described it as probably one of the most extraordinary structures you'd ever seen. So he was down crawling around in here. So this is a space big enough for a man to get into, built by these tiny creatures entirely for the purpose of environmental control. As an environmental engineer, you can imagine I like that. I like space in my in mechanical rooms. Don't I, Selchuk? Um, and um, so the, the other thing that's worth saying here is that the creatures also have an amazing uh, boiler system. Uh, they, they generate heat 
through by growing mushrooms, which are their basic food stuff. So they, they chew wood, but bring the wood back to their, uh, their caves here, and they lay the wood down in these caves, and on the, on the wood, they grow mushrooms. And those mushrooms, when they germinate, give off heat, and they ge only germinate at night. Somehow we don't know how that happens, but that's how it happens. And so they heat the nest with an organic boiler system, which is incredible as well. This is the back of the queen, uh, who produces thousands of offspring every day, which is why she likes to be precisely climate controlled. Um, and this is the ventilation shafts inside a nest. Uh, uh, what, what this guy is a guy called Dr. Rupert Saw, who has taken an old nest that's been abandoned and filled it with plaster of Paris and then taken away all the earth so he could then model the, the, the, the air passageways. He bought a big machine in there and he sliced it in five millimeter layers and he's videoed the whole exercise. So he now has a precise 3D mapping of inside the nest and they're now modeling the ventilation to see how it works. Whether it'll teach us anything, I don't know, but it's kind of a fun exercise. So there's a quick story about how environmental engineers that really are quite humbling for us as human beings because they take their environmental control so seriously <clears throat> and achieve so much with relatively so little. And I want to show you how some of those ideas have inspired us in our, in our buildings through the years. There's always been a tension in the UK between naturally ventilated, the natural ventilation school and the mechanical ventilation school. Is it better for us to seal buildings up tight and manage the airflow or is it better for us to maximize natural ventilation? This project we did best part of 18 years ago. It's a health center in North London. Um, and the whole thing was designed in a very similar way, in a, uh, I like to think like a termite nest, with the, these vertical chimneys that you see here joining all the rooms together, or separating the rooms rather, the rooms in between. And just a, a cutaway diagram uh, basically shows a very simple ventilation system where each room, which is a highly thermally massive space, is linked to the outside by a chimney, which goes up through a damper here, um, not made of mud, but made of metal, to uh, an outlet vent. The inlet comes in through here, the air comes in from the quiet cor uh, courtyard down through a pipe in the ground, which I think you'd agree is somewhat like the air tubes that bring the air into the, to the, to the termite nest. I'll leave the uh, metaphor there, I think, for now, park it. But then the air comes in here and conditions that keeps this room uh, well ventilated. It also allows us to do a very important thing. It allows us to naturally ventilate the room at night in the summertime, so we can leave these vents open without compromising the security of the building and let the building breathe at night. So the temperature, the thermal mass of the building cool, is cooled um, and very securely it's uh, vent allowed to then um, uh, to ventilate. At the point when the building is cool enough, the, the damp is automatically closed and the building is then sealed up for the night. So and that building has stayed, it's been very effective. But the problem it has is in the winter time, this is such an effective ventilation system that when it's very cold outside and very warm inside, all the heat escapes very quickly. So although the building is very comfortable, it does use a lot of energy for heating because you're not recovering any of the energy at this chimney. So we moved on from that to, to look at buildings that were, uh, many buildings that have, are much more, uh, have much more controlled ventilation. This is a, a library extension in the, uh, in the university uh, in, in Leicester, and in, in sort of the Midlands. Um, and it's, it, it was built um, so about 1994, 1995, I think. And we used a system called Thermodec. Now, Thermodec, sorry, I should just wind back a bit. The, the brief was to um, build a, a modern library, which means it has no books, it just has computers, and it has a hell of a lot of students in it. <clears throat> now, if we naturally ventilated that building, which is what the client originally wanted, we would open the windows here in the winter, and the cold air would come across here. It would have to have lots of heat at the edge in order to, keep, to get, make the air warm enough to ventilate all the students and then the air would have zipped off up a chimney somewhere to be dissipated at roof level. We said if you take all the heat from these machines, take all the heat from the uh, students, that's more than enough to heat the building if we can some, find some way of capturing it and storing it. So what we do is we have a, a heat recovery machine, a ventilation machine up at the roof. The air is extracted here from the space up to the heat recovery machine. We recover 85% of the energy and into the fresh air coming in, we pass the fresh air through these concrete planks in the ceiling and deliver it into the space. Now, these concrete planks are a standard precast concrete module that's been modified on site by drilling the, the cores out to turn it into a long air duct. So it becomes like a giant storage heater, big thermal mass. And that allows us in the winter time to store heat, but also in the summer time, we, we cool the structure down overnight so that even with all that heat gain in the space, we're able to keep the space comfortable the following day. So, this um, very simple system um, has allowed this, this um, library, and this is it just showing how it's integrated in. There's the ducts here connecting into the, uh, into the spaces, and then a return air goes back up to the roof. 
So this building has used no heating since it was built. It basically runs on student power, student heat, and it's a, often a forgotten resource in, in analyzing heating systems. Is the, the main resource is the people in the building. If you can recycle their energy, like we're all creating heat now, I can feel it all coming off, off you at, towards me. As we, as we create heat, um, that, that can be part of the resource of the building through heat recovery. And we have this, this video, this thing's gone wrong, but we have this uh, clever machine then on the, on the roof that takes the air from the, um, the space, passes it twice through a heat exchanger, the fresh air comes in from outside and goes through into the space with 85% of the energy recovered. Now, what that means is we can change the air in the space every 12, 12 and a half minutes, so it's five times an hour. So the air is really fresh, but we're not putting any extra heat in because the heat's coming from what the students in the space. In the summertime, we can add some evaporative cooling. So in the summertime, we spray water onto the return air path much like the old termites again, sorry to do it, to keep mentioning them, but the, we spray water onto the return air, which cools the return air down, so the fresh air coming in from outside is cooled as it passes over the other side of the plates. This is called indirect evaporative cooling, or adiabatic cooling, and it's a very powerful tool for, um, for, for providing free cooling. It would work really well in this climate here as a way of cooling things, but the equipment's quite expensive because you have to be very careful about Legionella and, and um, spraying water about. So it's, a, it's a quite an expensive piece of kit. So we've done many buildings using that kind of technique, using thermal mass within the building. When you get onto bigger projects, bigger spaces, it can be more difficult to figure out how to get thermal mass. So take a space like this. How, there's no, it's very, the thermal mass, if you had a massive ceiling, is a long way away from you. So it, it's difficult to make it part of the environmental control system. Um, we started to work on this project called the Earth Centre, which is sited in a, an old colliery spoil heap in the north of England. Um, and the first phase of it was a thing called the Planet Earth Gallery. It's a 7,000 square metre gallery complex that looks something like this now. Um, it has outside it a, a timber, timber structure made of forest thinnings with a 500 square metre photovoltaic array on the top, which is part of the energy generation system. But the main thing I just wanted to focus on is this gallery space. We were um, the site was a, an, old, say, an old colliery spoil heap, so the ground was really poor. So the structural engineer was looking at building a giant raft to support the building on. Um, they had a fault line going under the building, so they couldn't put piles down. So we had this huge raft. And I had one of those sort of eureka moments. I think I was in the I usually have eureka moments in the shower. I was standing, why don't we hollow all this thing out like the Romans used to do and make a labyrinth under the floor and turn this into our control system? So this was the fir my first sort of thoughts about how we might um, uh, hollow out this, raft, this big thick concrete raft and um, make air pass through it and use it as part of like a big um, thermodex system if you like. So here was a series of sketches for different times of the year that I uh, emailed off to, or faxed in those days actually, faxed off to Peter Clegg, the uh, British architect, great environmental architect, and we, back, we th went backwards and forwards over a period of a few days and, and developed this idea for the labyrinth. There was another bit of um, inspiration, which this is an, an illustration I found recently of a, of a, of a quite a well-known scheme. This is the, what's called the Villas Costozza, which are some ancient villas, uh, well not ancient, 17th century villas uh, north of Rome. This illustration is by Barbara Kender, um, which shows a wonderful thing. It shows, this is the villa itself, but this illustration shows uh, Prometheus, who stole the sun from the god's use, throwing rays down onto this house and heating it up. And at the same time, Zephyrus, who is the god of the west wind, blowing air into these cave system, and, and the cave system is, is underground, is all cool, and the houses all have these uh, marble grills in the floor, and the air wafts up from the cave system and provides cooling to the, um, to the, to the, to the houses. Now, isn't that it's a wonderfully poetic kind of example from, from, uh, from old architecture about the ingenuity of man to keep themselves comfortable? So taking that in mind, Peter started to evolve the sketch and we worked together collaboratively. We worked together to develop this idea of this labyrinth that would go under the building. And ultimately it came out <clears throat> looking something like this. So you've got these uh, passageways below the building that on a night time we blow air through the passageways and, th and throw it and dump it. And they, the air the passages get colder and cooler and cooler and cooler with night air. The following day when the air is hot we pass it through the cool concrete and push it up into the space through floor grills, displacement grills, to provide free cooling. So here's it under construction, um, concrete and block as our main thing. Now, seeing the presentation this morning by BASF uh, on, on uh, phase change materials, just imagine if we could do this with phase change materials, you could actually do away with the need for any cooling. If you start to line or well, make these walls of concrete with PCMs in, you could do an absolutely incredible job at keeping this place cool. 
So this was um, uh, one of the exhibitions within the gallery space. So the air is coming up through the floor here, somewhere you can't see it, and then exhaust at a high level. The Earth Centre sadly didn't survive because it hit all the right buttons in terms of, econo uh, of environmental sustainability, but it missed a key point of economic sustainability and that they, they built uh, the Earth Centre in somewhere that turned out not to be the centre of the Earth um, and people didn't come. Um, and so they had to close down through lack of interest, which is a great shame because the buildings were a fantastic example of how you can build great um, environmental uh, ideas into architecture. A couple of years after that, we were doing a competition for a project down in Melbourne called Federation Square. And um, here we had a challenge which was to, air to keep comfortable a 300 meter long arcade that runs right through the middle of the scheme. Um, this is, uh, the whole thing is built on a crash deck over the rail lines that go into the main railway station. And this is the new um, Museum of Australian and Aboriginal Art and a broadcasting centre here. And then the main piece of it was a square, for, not quite square, but a squarish thing for 20,000 people to gather um, for Anzac Day and to watch England beating Australia at cricket and that sort of thing. Um, and um, the okay, token Brit here, obviously, enjoying that one. Um, so this is the square, and under this piazza is the world's biggest labyrinth. Um, we, we looked at the weather in, in Melbourne, which is generally, in the summertime particularly, it's very warm at daytime, but pretty cool at night as the wind swings round to the south. And, um, excuse me, so I went down to, to, to Melbourne with this idea of basically um, uh, putting a, a large labyrinth in the area underneath the crash, underneath this deck, but above the crash deck over the railway station, uh, over the railway lines, beg your pardon. And to my amazement, they, well, they asked me a couple of questions. Oh, would I please slow down? <laughs> okay. So, um, so I told you I was talk too fast. Got too many things to say, it's a problem. So um, I went down to, to present this, um, this scheme to um, the locals, uh, the, well, the, the, the, uh, the, the project managers and the architects. The architects were totally on message with it. The client loved the idea. The project managers were going through uh, a cost cutting. And when Australians do cost cutting like nobody I've ever met, it's carnage. Um, and it, they, I went down with the basic and said to them, it's about a, a nine, ten year payback. It's about two million dollars over and above the budget. Um, and they took all that on board and they asked me one question. They said, has Sydney got one? Um, and the city of Sid cities of Sydney and Melbourne compete ferociously to be the best at everything. Um, and I said, no, Sydney hasn't got one and this will be the biggest one in the Southern Hemisphere. And they said, we'll have it. Uh, and so it survived all the cost cutting that went on and became very much part of the iconic an iconic feature of the, of, the, um, of the scheme. And I think that's an important point in understanding about sustainability and where the world is today in sustainability and sustainable thinking. For whatever the reasons, the competition that benchmarking has invoked, for example, LEED and BRIAM, has been a game changer. In America, everybody is trying to get the, the best building, the greenest building. When we started working at Yale, all their buildings were LEED certified, or they, they decided to go LEED certified. Within uh, a couple of months, Harvard had decided to go for lead silver. So Yale immediately said, right, we're going for lead gold. And then Harvard went for gold, so y Yale went up to platinum, and now they all do platinum buildings um, as part of their kind of standard thing. So th this game changing, game raising, is part of, it's happening with hotel chains, it's happening with big corporations, it's the way things are going. So this was a good case of it, where Sydney wanted, uh, sorry, Melbourne wanted to get one up on Sydney. So here's the, sorry, this is the atrium that we're conditioning. Uh, these, you can just about make out these wooden slats in the floor, which are the displacement grills that let the air in, let the heat rise up. And this is the labyrinth um, under construction. So what you see here, there are about four and a half meter high concrete walls on a one meter pitch. Um, and the walls have made with a, a ripple to try and maximize surface area and to encourage the heat transfer as much as it can. So the air passes backwards and forwards. So it travels about 250 meters from uh, in, through the labyrinth backwards and forwards before it comes out into an air handling unit and gets delivered into the space. And in that 250 meters, it cools down um, from a temperature sometimes up to 43, 44 degrees centigrade and uh, down to a condition where we can control this atrium space to around about 25 degrees centigrade on the hottest day. And we've, this has been running now for many years and is, is, been, is very successfully uh, keeping the space cool without any, without any refrigeration. Now, here's another big message from this, and it's a message to contractors and people who are investors in buildings. This, uh, this thing here will still be there in 100 years' time, because it's pretty solid. 
In that time, you would have changed the chillers, you would have changed the air handling plant, and you would have changed all the other kits that goes with the refrigeration system four times. So not only are you avoiding, um, avoiding energy use now, you're avoiding future environmental costs for disposing of, uh, disposing of materials and to recreating new chillers and so on. So sustainability, in, in terms of if you can get people to think intergenerationally, thinking for a very long game, that's often a, a great benefit. So this just shows, again, these temperatures, amazing ability for labyrinths to stabilize temperature. So what you're doing is moving the day to the night and the night to the day. And um, again, with phase change materials, we could do it even better, I'm sure. And it's a very scalable technology. This is another little building we've done in um, uh, at Kew Gardens, which is one of our botan national botanical garden in the UK. This tiny little thing here, it's only about 110 square meters. But it sits on top of a, a little labyrinth, normally a... Um, a uh, an alpine house would have a refrigeration system to keep the plants cool. This doesn't. This has a, uh, a labyrinth uh, under, underneath. Sorry, I should just go back to that. The, the air passes backwards and forwards through. It's very simple, just dense block uh, laid on edge. The air passes backwards and forwards a few times before it pops out through these grills here. Uh, maybe we could have done slightly more subtly with the grills, but anyway, the, the um, pops out through these pipes and keeps the alpine plants in the cool c conditions that they're kind of accustomed to. And here we have a very highly transparent facade that uh, maintains something like um, 75,000 lux uh, on, the, on the plants for the very high, high light levels they require. I'll come back to more glass houses in a minute. Um, but this just shows some of the techniques here. We also had to shade the building in the summertime to shade the plants to stop them from, from burning in too much heat. And the space the building naturally ventilates between the shade and the outside wall. Sometimes... Um, you can find thermal mass in other ways. And this is a technique um, what I'm going to just gonna talk about now called earth ducts. Or, uh, the Germans call them Erdkanal, I think, is the expression. So I'm looking at the G German gentleman in the front. But it's the, a way, another way of naturally cooling buildings. Um, this is a business park in Luton, just to the north of England, north of London, rather. Um, and here, this building is conditioned by, from, th with air that comes through these, uh, these things out in the car park. And the air comes down a 180-meter-long uh, tube buried a meter below the ground. And it runs backwards and forwards through this tube before it comes out into an air handling plant to keep the buildings cool. The, um, it's a very simple technology. It's just a pipe in the ground covered with, back with earth. And you, the, the coolness of the earth is, uh, basically helps you to condition the space. Uh, quite widely used in Germany, almost never used in the UK till now, although it's starting to be used now. Um, and this is a scheme in Toronto. Uh, it's also quite widely used in Canada um, as part of the uh, environmental control system for, for buildings. And again, what I would just say about this is that, you know, in terms of thermal capacity, what we're looking to do is to, to, to attenuate these swings in temperature. So this is an actual reading of the building management system of the outside temperature here and the air coming off the earth pipe here. So on a day when, in England, we had once three days consecutively at 32 degrees centigrade, it doesn't happen very often, but the earth duct was still supplying air at 17 degrees centigrade, and the air coming through the floor here was cool enough at that point to keep the space comfortable. Now, energy is temperature over time. So if you think about all of that as avoided air conditioning energy, you can see what a very simple, a very, very simple way this is of reducing air conditioning loads and reducing the demand on systems. So this type of technology is the kind of thing you guys need to be looking at for step change in environmental performance in certain types of building. And it can apply in lots of different places. You had a, a sneaking, a fleeting glimpse of this project earlier on in the Shanghai, um, uh, the, the images by, uh, from earlier about, with Sh about Shanghai and their, their passive cooling systems. This is, um, we worked on the, the British Pavilion in Shanghai with the artist and architect Thomas Heatherwick. Um, and here also the, the cooling for the main uh, exhibition space that sat within the, um, this extraordinary pavilion that he designed with its polycarbonate walls. Um, and uh, can you see the face in there? It's a very strange face. Um, it was, was all done with an earth duct uh, for, for, for preconditioning the air as it came into the space. You, know, you can see the face now. It's a rather bizarre effect that you get from the, the, the, um, the view, the, just the, the angle of the photographs taken. But each of these 60,000 rods had three seeds in the end, and the rods were taken down and have been sent all over China, and the seeds have been planted all over China, apparently to, uh, to I don't know what to do, but to create a, a sense of, of, of sharing from the British Botanical Gardens at Kew. And uh, th it was just an extraordinary structure. I put it in, not because it's particularly environmental, but it looks rather nice. So another technology that you're starting to see more and more is a, a thing called the ground source heat pump, and I think that's been discussed earlier today. 
Um, this is one of the first buildings in the UK that used the, the piles that um, support the, the wall structure uh, to, to do um, uh, the heating and cooling. So here we have uh, piles that go, go down in the, that actually hold the building up that have pipes in. Um, in the winter time, you basically extract heat from the ground because this graph shows that this is distance below ground and temperature, that once you get six or eight meters below the ground, the temperature is consistently at around about nine or 10 degrees centigrade in the UK. So we can drag heat out of the ground through a very efficient heat pump and provide heating to the building. In the summertime, in the summertime we can reverse it and cool the structure down and send the, the heat back into the ground, again, with a, making the chiller extremely efficient. So this shows the, the arrangement. We have pipes uh, in the piles uh, that go around and support the basement, basically. And we're looking to do this at a project over here at the moment, um, more on which in a minute. So here's the, um, the winter condition and the summer condition, where we're actually then, uh, with pipes bedded in the slabs, we then uh, heat, reject heat to the ground. So all these systems are now becoming quite normal as part of our, uh, um, you know, our, our understanding of uh, the application of green technology in building. And it really is quite crude. It's, you know, the, the, the, this guy here is at Keeble College is putting the pipes into the reinforcing bars before, um, before they're pushed into the, into the ground as part of the piling system. Now this, I think this is a simple photograph, but it does speak to collaboration. It says that you know, not only have we as the engineers got to be dealing with it, the architects and structural engineers who are making all the, and specifying all of this equipment have to be part of the conversation and the debate about how you do even these most basic things. And it's about everything doing more than one job. You know, the structural slab is part of the cooling system. The piles are part of the heating and cooling system. This is integrated design, not just sticking an air conditioner in a space. It's a big difference. Um, and then, but you get spaces that look perfectly normal, but this happens to have a radiant cooling slab, underfloor air supply with evaporative cooling, and uh, the piles that are holding the wall up are doing the heating and cooling. So it's much more integrated. Possibly the most uh, high performance building we've done so far in, our, in my career, or I've done in my career, is this building, which is the new forestry school at Yale University with Hopkins Architects. Um, it sort of took everything that we'd ever learned about green buildings and put it all into one, build, one, one shell. The client wanted a zero carbon building. We haven't quite achieved that, but we've came, come reasonably close. Um, what, what we have here is a building in the climate of New Haven, Connecticut, which is a climate where it's pretty cold in the winter and rather hot and humid in the summer, so not dissimilar to here, um, and very nice spring and autumn. So a building that's actually what you'd look for in that is a building that can be naturally ventilating for a large part of the year, and then for the short seasons when it's hot and cold, um, you want to be able to close it down. So the building has a narrow plan so it can naturally ventilate easily. It has uh, uh, exposed, thermal, uh, exposed slabs overhead for thermal mass so that we can cool those down at night and keep the building as comfortable for as long as possible. It has a, a, a, actually here a 1,800 foot deep borehole, no, 1,200 foot borehole, a standing well borehole um, for uh, heating and cooling. It has underfloor air distribution, it has uh, uh, all kinds of other things I'll show you in a sec. And then here you see in the foreground the um, grey water treatment. This is the third stage of the grey water treatment before it goes back into the building to be reused. On the facade here, solar panels for hot water heating, and here on the roof, on the south facade, the uh, PV panels that generate power to run the building. This is the second most energy efficient building in America. We just missed being the best, and the second highest lead score has ever been posted for a building. Um, and it, it, it scored, I think, all but one lead point that it could possibly have achieved, um, and is a very high platinum rating. But we did a huge amount of work on, on daylighting and studying the environment that for, the, for the occupants. Um, we, as I say, we worked it through so that we could naturally ventilate the building by the way that the vents are integrated into the door heads of private offices and then a central well that the air goes up before it ventilates out at the top. You see here the thermal mass and here an issue of coordination. When you're exposing concrete for construction, the importance of coordinating so that you get um, everything looking tightly controlled is, is, really, imp is really important. Uh, can't overstress that. Um, the interesting and unusual thing on this building is that the, the way that we encourage the students to integrate with the building. When it gets to winter, to deep winter, or uh, the height of, height of summer, they get a message on their computers to tell them whether today is a naturally ventilated day or is it a, a mechanically ventilated day. And there are little lights around the building, a little two lights, red and green lights. When the lights are green, they're allowed to open the windows or they're encouraged to open the windows. When the lights go red, they're encouraged to keep the windows closed and let the mechanical ventilation system do the job of either uh, passively cooling or, or actively heating the space. 
So a very simple mechanism for feedback and to get the occupants taking part in the use of the building. In the early days of the project, it had a labyrinth. Um, unfortunately, this was an example where we couldn't make the labyrinth work. There wasn't enough space to make it work, so it disappeared. Um, and we have these very high-performance heat recovery units that I showed you earlier doing the job there, which are these things, uh, part of the, the, the ventilation control system. The deep borehole, the rainwater recycling system, all in all, you know, an incredibly highly integrated um, uh, environmental building um, that we were, were very proud of having been involved with. Um, and here's just some of the renewable energy going on, the PV panels going on. You even get happy PV installers. It's a miracle for you. Um, these are the PV panels shading the, the roof light, and then this is the solar hot water heating. And um, in terms of its re performance relative to other buildings, um, the a typical building under American code would, would be doing about um, 250 kilowatt hours a square meter a year, and we're down at about 76 kilowatt hours a square meter a year. So even with all of that, we're not quite at zero carbon but we're at about 25 or 30% of the energy of a conventional building. Um, without a huge extra cost, although I would be lying to you if I said it, wasn't, it was an inexpensive building. But that's Yale for you, they, don't spend, they do spend money well. Um, and uh, the inside of this space is, is a testament to, to the use of local resources. All the timber here came from the Yale forests. Interesting problem we've got with this building now is that it's using something like 50% more energy than we predicted. And the reason for that is that it's so popular. Um, this space is one of the most popular places on the Yale campus. It's open to all students. So every desk here is occupied all the day with people working. They all plug their laptops in, so all the plug loads have shot are much higher than we expected. So that we're victims of our own success, and obviously the ventilation loads, we've got demand control ventilation, we have to ventilate more because there are more people there. Um, and as a result of that, we actually, the building, as having, because it's successful, is actually using more energy than we ever, ever thought it would. However, that's, per capita, it's probably doing rather well. I mentioned we were working with Selchuk and his team at Avci Architects uh, on a couple of projects here. This is a project we're just literally going ahead with right now. It's the headquarters building for the TMB uh, in Ankara. Ankara has a wonderful climate for designing environmental buildings. Um, and um, this project looks is a, um, basically a, a, a partly a um, a convention centre or a mini convention centre, a meeting centre for the members of TMB plus some resident staff. Um, and the early concept models for the building were for a building um, that uh, was uh, partly um, was, was using a labyrinth technology principally as a way of, of, of moderating climate um, and using a, a thermal mass storage system both built into the space and built into the basement to provide the conditions that we need and to provide the thermal storage that we need. So the work that was done early on was all about trying to get the facades to work right, to figure out where we needed to put shade, how we needed to make the build, screen the building to get great daylight, but not to get uh, too, too high a heat gain. Um, so the weather in Ankara is great for passive building, but it is pretty warm in the peaks of daytime, but it's also pretty cool at night. So you've got this big day-night swing to work with. Environmental engineers like that, big variation in temperature. Um, and again, this is somewhere something where with a bit more um, phase change materials, we might also be able to make this work even better. Um, humidity is relatively low, so we don't have a big problem with humidity, so again, it's a very easy climate for thermal storage. So we're looking to maximize solar gain in winter, when it's very cold, but to minimize it in the summer months, which we're doing through the, the flexible shading system. And um, say so we've just started to, detail, to do detailed design work on this, but under the bottom of the whole thing, hopefully, will be a, a, about a, a two meter high labyrinth space, um, which we've worked through um, schematically um, in a similar kind of way to the one in Melbourne. So here the air comes in through here at night time. We flush the labyrinth out with cool air. And in the daytime, we're able to then take the, the, air, the, the um, air, pass it through about 250 meters length of passageway to provide all the free cooling that we want. Um, and um, this is the uh, inside the space. We then pass the air through the concrete slabs in a similar way to Thermodec and connect it to a chill beam just to provide the final bit of trim. But that chill beam will be about a third or a quarter of the size of a normal one in an office building. Um, we're working with Braymore Estates. I should just say, actually, um, that we're working with some local engineers on, on, um, on the TMB building. Um, and it's Okatan Associates who are, are helping us with uh, the, the sort of working with the local market, which is great. Great to be collaborating with them. Um, we're working with Bra Braymore Estates at the Jacaranda Estate in Bodrum, um, and also with, with Selchuk's team. And here, trying to figure out ways of, of, of de delivering uh, high environmental performance villas, residential villas. Um, these look like common or garden villas, but actually they use, we're trying to in, uh, use a very old technology of rock storage 
as our way of storing energy here. Very simple, but basically using a, a big chamber filled with rocks as the, as the air is going to be passed through before it conditions the space. Um, we've, doing, we've done all the uh, CFD modeling of this to prove that it'll work and to show how it works um, and to, to show that we can d develop you know, good quality, very, very high quality um, uh, residences in this climate that don't need big air conditioners to operate, which I think is a very important thing. So finally, I'm just going to talk to you now about the, the one, one last project, which is um, probably the project that, uh, as a, in my career, I had dreamed of getting and never thought I would. It's called Gardens by the Bay in Singapore, which is on a site just here. This, this, um, project is a, this building here is the Opera House in Singapore that we were lucky enough to design the facade for about 15 years ago. And it normally appears at the start of my lecture, but I'd have had you here all day if I'd kept all these things in. So this one's disappeared. The big image of it is on the wall over there. Um, but this project here is the, the Gardens by the Bay, and it was a, a competition that we entered uh, with a, a landscape architect called Andrew Grant for a new botanical gardens uh, right near the center, city centre in Singapore. Um, the key components of this are two enormous glass houses. Uh, one, this one is uh, over 200 metres long, so the size of two football pitches. Uh, this one is a smaller one, but 65 metres high. So we entered a competition. This is the video of the competition winning scheme. I'm hoping there's sound. So, um, looking at the site here, um, and we were basically trying to evoke um, all these natural processes through the video and through the demonstration of a kind of integrated design. So the earliest messages you're getting is about natural cooling, about simple natural forms. These are called super trees. These are the main, a big vertical garden feature that uh, um, a, a part of the kind of entry into the garden through a cluster of, of this huge vertical gardens. The idea is also that we tell stories about environment and sustainability through the, uh, through the interaction that you'll get as you go around the gardens. Um, some simple ideas about energy storage by, by water pumping, the use of shade and so on. These are our environmental diagrams rather rapidly passed over. And then the idea of the um, protective canopy to hold out uh, the dry biome, which is it's got to be kept at Mediterranean temperatures in the tropics on the equator. So it's enormous internal space. Uh, which provides a huge daylit volume for plants to grow. It doesn't look quite like this anymore. I'll show you some other images in a sec. And then you move out of a dry biome into the, the tropical wet biome. So this is a humid space, like the top of a mountain, housing tropical montane plants that also require very high levels of daylight, 45,000 lux, to, to grow and to germinate. So at the time you're doing these competitions, you see all these videos and think, yeah, this will never happen. This will never happen. No chance. But um, So we, we went on to win the competition, um, and um, to our amazement, the client turned up in our office um, and said, you've won it. I know where you live. We have four years to deliver it. So we were four of us who were part of the core team started out on it. So this, was, this is the plan of the cool dry. This is the plan of the cool moist. To put some perspective, the little alpine house I showed you earlier is that big. Um, so it's, uh, they're enormous structures. Um, this is approaching through the super tree cluster to the main cool, dry, cool, moist biomes. And um, the plant species that we're putting in them, are, are, here it's unusual, that our client is not really people, our client is plants. We have to keep the plants comfortable and in the right environment. So the, here the, the, the tropical montane are from the cool, higher regions in the green zone. The pink is the most challenging one. Here it's the, the European plants, and of course Singapore is here, right on the equator. So the balance of daylight and heat was a, was a phenomenal problem for us as environmental designers. We also had to, uh, at night time, we have to cool the space down even more so that the, the, the, so that the plants will ignite, which basically means they'll germinate. Um, so there's some really big challenges for us in terms of developing the design. The criteria all came from a project called Eden, uh, which is a project in Cornwall, uh, where they, they have managed to propagate and grow a tropical garden in a very subtropical climate. This is inside the cool dry, um, with this vast table here um, with, uh, with massive amounts of planting on. These are big trees sitting on top here. So whenever I look at this picture, I kind of go, ah, because um, it's, it's, you can get this sort of some idea of the scale. But as we modeled the daylight, we found that we couldn't deal with these. The original design for these were of big fin structures, which we thought would be part of a shading system. They actually took out too much light, so we had to switch to a different structure, which is a grid shell suspended below a slender steel structure with struts. And then built in, and then on the cool moist, uh, we have inside a giant waterfall, 
um, and again, just a, a huge amount of, um, of, of issues in trying to get the, the, the light and the humidity levels right. So here was some um, daylight modeling. One of the things we can now do, whereas 15 years ago it was very intuitive, we can now absolutely model um, light levels and predict exactly how things are going to perform. So here we were able to talk to the horticulturalists about where they would plant different species depending upon resultant light levels. But with all this glass on the equator, we had a real problem in full sunshine. Um, and so we had to fight tooth and nail with the client to allow us basically to be able to shade the building externally. So the building has huge sails that um, come out from the main structural lines. Uh, they're triangular sails on a tension cable system that pull out. The first 25 of them went in or were operating last week for some, tr for some controls trials. So they, they, um, they are in and, work and working at the moment. But they deploy out of the main structural elements. They're, they're hidden away inside the structure. And so the elements you get are the main building and then the, the glass skin suspended below a superstructure with the shades hanging off. Environmentally, we used, had to use every technology in the book to make this work. Um, this is some CFD modeling that we did, computational fluid dynamics, to prove temperatures at low level where the people and the root systems are. And then we were allowed to let the temperature rise as the building got higher. So we're, again, we're using displacement. We're displacing the heat up out of the occupied zone. All the paving has chilled water pipe work in, and we have air distributed out at low level at a, a very significant volume, about 100 meters cubed a second in one of the biomes. So how do we do that sustainably? Is this, you know, look at this, this could be the most unsustainable project on the planet unless you can figure out a way of doing this sustainably. Well, I was fortunate to have a, a conversation with, um, this is the cool, cool, dry, cool moist, sorry, similar kind of, sim similar issues. I was talking at a, a cocktail party early on to the head of NParks, and he was lamenting that his, NParks, sorry, is the National Parks of Singapore. He was lamenting that his main problem is he has to look after two million trees around Singapore, these rain trees. And they trim them, each tree gets dealt with once every uh, two years, it gets pruned. So they have hundreds of tons of wood waste a week that they currently either landfill or just dispose of. So we thought, well, what about if we could use that as an energy source for our garden, uh, or for their garden? And so what we d devised was a system where we um, use the timber as part of an integrated, sort of a huge, holistic, enhanced ecosystem, as we call it. And the, the, the basic thing that happens is the biomass, which is the timber, gets chipped and dried off site, mixed with packing case waste, is brought to site and burned in a very large uh, biomass boiler, about seven megawatt biomass boiler. The heat from that, the steam, goes into a turbine which generates power, that generally puts power onto some electric chillers. Uh, the ash that comes off the, bi the biomass boiler goes back into the garden as part of the fertilizer system. Then the heat from that steam turbine goes into the waste heat, because it comes off as high pressure hot water, goes into an absorption chiller, which basically drives the first stage cooling in the, part in the, in the gardens, with the electric chillers coming in with power off the turbines as a second stage. And any surplus heat is rejected. We then have some low-grade heat, and we thought, what can we do with lots of low-grade heat? And we thought, what we have to do in Singapore is we have to dry the air, because the air is really, really humid in the tropics. And so we use a system called liquid desiccant dehumidification. Have I lost you now? The liquid desiccant. So if you, when you buy an electrical appliance or a handbag or some shoes or something, you get a little bag in it which says, do not eat. You know the one I mean? Don't eat it, it's not very nice, but it's a silica gel, it's silicon, so it, it, it's a desiccant. It absorbs moisture and prevents the, the product from getting damp. Now, you can get that in liquid form. So if you imagine we spray liquid down from the ceiling of a, of a, a big, in, a big, in a cellar, and you pass the air that's going to go into the, uh, the, the, uh, the, gu the glass house through it, and it basically takes moisture out of the air as the air passes through it. So you end up with more water on the floor, or more liquid on the floor, than started at the ceiling. So then you've got this weak desiccant. The only way you can get rid of that water is to boil it off, and we boil it off with the waste heat from our turbines. So effectively what you have here is, is a sort of z a low energy use, uh, or a zero energy, zero carbon uh, desiccant drying system. So we can then basically condition all of the air with, um, with only that single fuel source, which is the waste wood from the gardens. And in case you thought it could never happen, as we didn't, here it is under construction. Um, these, this is the first biome, this topped out in February, um, and they're now just for say finishing off the controls trials. You get an idea of how big it is um, from the size of these cranes inside. Um, and it's, it is absolutely huge. All these vents here are for letting the displacement air in, which are all integrated into the flower beds. And everything is pretty much invisible in terms of environmental control in the space. Under, underground, we do have a fairly hefty infrastructure of, um, of equipment. Um, and the cool moist is now nearing completion as well. And also the super trees are coming up with all their water tanks and rainwater recycling systems built into them. 
Um, these are designed um, by an old friend of, of with, with, in collaboration with an old friend of Sue and I, a guy called Alan Brooks. He's working with Neil Thomas, my colleague at Atelier One, the structural engineers, to come up with these very clever skins for the buildings. So there we are. That's it. Um, uh, a new a new presence on the Singapore skyline, uh, coming soon, uh, hopefully. So just to wrap up, I've just I was this is a cartoon I found from the RIBA journal in 1976, which kind of speaks to where we are today in a, in a big, very strong way. Louis Hellman is the cartoonist who's done cartoons for the national for the RIBA for many years, um, and he says that environmental design is not an exact science. We can never be right. The question is how wrong can we afford to be? So that's my first finishing quote. But the more, I think, almost more prescient in this cu current context of life in Turkey is a question that you, you should maybe look back to Bucky Fuller and, and read this, which says, if the success or failure of the planet and of human beings depended upon how I am and what I do, how would I be, what would I do? Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I'm sorry if I talk too fast. <laughs> Thanks. Sayın Patrick Bilva çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ekodizayn Konferansı 2011 son konuşmacısı olarak değişen dünyada yapılı çevrenin risklerini azaltmak başlığında düşük karbon salımlı eko yapıların tasarımı ve değişen iklimle yapılı çevrede riski azaltmak üzerine konuşmasını yapmak üzere yazdığı 12 kitap ile uluslararası arenada ses getiren ödüllü mimar, eğitimci, tasarımcı Susan Ruff'u Sahneye davet ediyorum ki kendisi de burada. Thank Sözü you. kendisine bırakıyorum. Thank you. Thank you. How long do I have? Well, I come at the graveyard slot at the end of a long day. So I thought we might pay, play a game. A rather deadly game. The game is called a thousand and one nights. I am a rather plain, middle-aged Shehrazad, and you are Pasha. And I'm going to make you Pasha of um, intelligent investment. I will call you smart money. And I'm going to tell you 10 stories for the Pasha of smart money to see if I can persuade you not to dispose of me too early on, because this is a game about life and death. And you in this audience are incredibly important people, because you are pioneers of a new and growing movement in Turkey. I'm going to talk about 10 stories of how to minimize risk in this important game. So, have I got the... Yeah. You see, we are all moving into a world which is much riskier. You can divide risk into the hazard, how bad is it going to get? Exposure, how exposed are you to that hazard? And vulnerability. So if the hazard was flooding, it would mean, are you on a flood plain? Are you next to the river or the sea? And your vulnerability might be, what sort of building do you live in? How old are you? How young? How rich? How poor? How well? How ill? And so it's the combination of that exposure that really um, is an issue of whether you're going to, how well you're going to do in that hazard. Now, do you remember in those wonderful days of 2007, when everybody was building like there was no tomorrow? And then we began to understand the impact of economic risk on our business model. How many of us nearly went under during these difficult three or four years we've just been through? And what sort of future do we face in the building industry? And this is where I say to you as smart money that the choices we make now will mean where we will be positioned in the future and where our children will be positioned too because we live in a rapidly changing world. And the risk of climate change is um, 
absolutely severe because as globally, and you can see this is 1955, I was born in 52 just before that, 1952, these levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as measured have been steadily growing. This is from the industrial activities from our cities and buildings and so on. And as they rise, then you can see that so too as the carbon dioxide concentrations rise, so too are the global temperatures. We're around about here now. And in fact, we're just about a degree centigrade warmer than we were over the last 100 or 200 years. So already we're one degree centigrade warmer. See how fast, and we are currently in terms of global emissions following that brown line, see how fast that changes. By 2045, in 35 years, we'll be about another degree warmer. In 2065, 20 years after that, when our children will be beginning to retire, or mine, at, or yours maybe at least, we'll be three degrees centigrade warmer. Now, many of you now in Istanbul will know how different the climate is from what it was 30 years ago. Already you can see, this is 2000, oh, sorry, 2000, 2001 to 2005, the difference in temperature over those five years. And different parts of the world warm at different rates. What's most worrying now is that over the ice caps, we seem to be getting much higher temperatures, so the ice is melting faster than anyone really predicted. And you can see here with Turkey, an area of the world where you might be vulnerable to rapid heating because you've got quite a continental location. What is going to happen as the temperatures rise? We know that buildings will increasingly fail to keep people safe. So we have to build better, more resilient buildings. Communities, if communities aren't strong communities looking after each other, then they will begin to fail as well. We saw in Queensland, where we had the terrible floods this year, how those communities came out, each to help each other. And if we don't have those strong communities, then we can see what might happen. So we have to build stronger and stronger, more functional, resilient communities. Building infrastructures fail. We know that even in Britain, with heavy rain, the bridges wash out, the roads wash away, and somebody has to pay to rebuild them. So perhaps it's time to look at new paradigms of how we build infrastructure. And this bottom one, which is one which is seldom mentioned, this is the issue of system capacity. And I'll go into that a little further on. We've begun to get an idea of how bad things can be from really Katrina onwards, when we saw this terrific tragedy of what can happen in the space of a day, not necessarily just to buildings, but to society. A society can fall apart. And you can say that actually the, the climate has always changed. And if you look here, this is actually temperatures. This is a mean, the zero centigrade that we've worked from before. And we actually had a very cold period. The Ice Age only finished about 12,000 BC. And here, by about 7,000 BC, people had come out from the caves in southern Turkey, in the Taurus Mountains, where the Paleolithic tribes were located. And they'd come down into the agricultural lands between the Tigris and Euphrates, and they'd built the great civilizations. But the first village we know of, the first village was built about 9,000 years ago, the first one we've ex excavated. So here we get the emergence of brick and stone built villages. Within 
2,000 years, we had the great cities of Ur and Babylon. We had the great civilizations of Hattusha and the, um, the um, Anatolian civilizations. And temperatures have varied half a degree, a degree. And here in Europe, we had a little ice age. Um, and here you can see the scale of those changes. In fact, around about here, it was great for civilization in Anatolia and Mesopotamia. Some of your great civilizations emerged. And then, gradually, these rising temperatures, it's the scale of the rises that really are cause for alarm. I first came to Istanbul in 1975, and before some of you were born, and I remembered what I'd thought of as a floating city. It was suspended from heaven by these wonderful minarets, tied up. Some of the older people here will remember this floating city, tied to the heavens with the aspirations to reach up to God and seek the grander truths of the universe. I come back to Istanbul today, 35 years on, there is no floating city. It is a city weighed down by huge tower blocks, kept to the earth, and all thoughts of reaching for God have been lost in the skyscape scrapes of what is one of the greatest cities in the world. So, so short time ago, such a different world. And Patrick spoke of the great um, ant heaps. These buildings were like ant heaps. They were opened and closed and cools brought in. And the most sophisticated systems, look at this ventilation, this shading. Is it too much for us to expect that, for instance, a young generation of architects or engineers should come out knowing as much as the grand designers of a hundred years ago about how buildings work. I should think that that would not be, on, be beyond the wit of man, but how much do they know now? In a time when many people come out of schools of architecture around the world not knowing how to design a building or how buildings work at all, let alone how to do it properly. So here's one of the challenges we face. You see, Istanbul down on the Bosphorus is an architecture of wind and shade and light. If you go to Rajasthan, very, very hot northwestern India now, it's an architecture of the earth, coupled more as it is into the earth, because a building is either coupled, reaches out and moves with the outside climate, or it's coupled deep down into the earth, as Patrick's been trying to do, which is to get the stable temperatures from down below. And out of the Paleolithic time when the great um, civilizations of the world lived really in Anatolia and Mesopotamia, we got an architecture of the earth, Cappadocia, here, where... Um, who knows whether, you know, 20,000 years ago these houses were being occupied in a sort of sustainable architecture. Again, seeking that stability. So major impacts for Istanbul. Rising temperatures, extreme heat and cold, extreme storms and stronger winds, extreme rainfall events and sea level rises. All of these look such big things, don't they? And yet, I don't suppose any of you noticed this morning, we got a heavy downpour of rain and a strong wind down this valley. Did any no of you notice that there were three flapping pieces of roof up there that had the wind been a little stronger, could have taken that off? So somebody better go and fix those because we are going into a world. They're just up there, by the way. Um, so... I mean, what would you have done to the business here if those three panels had blown off in a, a storm and you had a conference underneath? So that's what I'm saying, that it sounds so far away, but affects our everyday lives. 
No more so than, for instance, 2003. I said buildings fail in extreme temperatures. S up to 50,000 people died in one week in Europe in July, um, August 2003. We had this extreme heat wave and in the ordinary houses in this area, particularly in France, 15,000 people died in a week. They were piling up in the morgues because it was the elderly who died typically and the ones who lived on the top floor because the heat rose and they had no insulation under the roof. So there's a lesson for you. Um, and other issues that you don't consider important now, um, the idea of how brittle a building is in extreme weather events. This is the Marriott Hotel just after Katrina, 29th of August 2005. You can still see the water in the streets here. Um, virtually every window blew out in this building. This is 18 months later and they hadn't even put plastic over the windows because the building was worthless. They wrote it off. They've actually, I think, refurbished that now. That was 2006. Look at City Hall. Low, robust, strong, um, naturally ventilated. They, never, they occupied that right the way through Katrina as a, a, a, an emergency centre. A brittle building. You've probably never thought about it. A peaky building. Now, peaky buildings are very, very dangerous. Um, this is a new one just being built by the Mahtoum, with investments from the Mahtoum family from Dubai. The Mahtoums are the one who went bankrupt um, building the Burj Dubai. They had to sell as Burj Khalifa. They virtually bankrupt, they could have bankrupt Dubai, a city with around about a hundred half-built tower blocks in it with cranes next to each of them. So now they've gone into London to invest in a more stable property market, yeah? I'm building up these stories here. But a peaky building is one that, that is, is, uses so much cooling on the hottest times of day and year that in New South Wales and Australia, 10% of all the electricity in New South Wales is used for 1% of the year on those very hot afternoons. And that's growing. So what electricity company is going to build 10% extra capacity for 1% of the year? They're not. So what's going to happen? As we get more and more, these are lead platinum buildings. We get peaky buildings, we get peaky cities. And what happens to peaky cities? The lights go out. This is New York, um, you probably remember it, that's 2003 again, hottest afternoon of the year, four o'clock. Half of the people had gone home and got all the air conditioning turned on at home. Half, half of the people were still and all, all the offices were still air conditioned. It blew the entire system, Five million, sorry, 50 million people in North, Northeast America without lights for 48 hours. You've got about, you can't open the windows in these buildings. You've got about half an hour to get out of these buildings because they go to about 80 degrees centigrade within about half an hour, some of them. From 50 up to 80. And in New Zealand, when they had 10 days in Auckland without electricity, they went to the top floor of 10-story buildings and the computer keyboards had melted. So, peaky cities, dark cities. And you think, well, maybe, you know, we've got some magic bullets. If you look, some people say our solution is nuclear energy. During that heat wave in France, the nuclear power stations right down the Rhone had to all be turned off because there was not enough water for cooling the power stations. So just at that time of year when they needed the power for the cooling, um, they've they had to turn these big stations down. When the lights went off in individual towns there, did that add to the people who died? I don't know. So there is, we no longer live in an age 
where of free energy or cheap energy or reliable energy. So do we have to design cities for that or what? Now when I was born in 1952, round about here, there was about just over two and a half billion people in the world. Think of Istanbul then, a million? No, half a million? And now we're 13, are we? 13 million? So this issue of more and more people using more and more resources, we get to the stage where um, issues of system capacity become important. And so you think, wow, we're so smart, we'll never get into the situation where um, this would be a real problem. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at... And yet, look at Los Angeles. Los Angeles, this is an issue of market saturation too. You're going to have to be very careful about. Los Angeles, just two years ago, opened up the big MGM development, funded by, in part, by the Maktoum family from Dubai, yeah? They built eight towers, large glass towers, Pele, Caesar Pelle, Norman Foster, top of the range, absolutely, first class, all efficient air conditioning systems, only there was an excess of capacity in the markets. So what was a 1.4 million pound penthouse mountain view flat is now going for $120,000. So listen, if you've got a test tube full of bacteria, they can double, they can double, they can double, they can double again until the test tube's half full. And then they double again and the chest tube's full and you've exceeded capacity. So you were talking earlier about more and more opportunities for bringing in investment. People like the Mahdoums, lovely, you know, they'll come and invest anywhere. Kazakhstan, you know, Istanbul, everywhere. But it's a system that's very, very fragile, not least because this is Lake Mead provides the only water in Nevada for Las Vegas. And the level of the water has been falling so rapidly that a new well in 2008, a report by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, leading institution in the world, said that there is a 50% chance that by 2021, Lake Mead might be dry. Would you invest there? So it's the system capacity, market system, environmental systems, and so on. And yet, in that one year, they put seven more golf courses in. So somewhere, somehow, there is not um, joined up thinking. And here we have this issue of Heat Island. This is an American city. As the population grows, the city gets hotter and hotter. Significantly, I think, um, Athens is now about 14 degrees centigrade hotter in the center than in the outside. The lower European cities, like old Istanbul, behave, they're much better behaved. Now we had two, we had two, three um, cases this morning. The man from Adana, who'd put in trees all around his building, he would lower the temperature. We had another development, sustainable development from Istanbul, where he had a courtyard full of white, highly reflecting buildings with highly reflecting glass and white, highly reflecting pavements. You could probably put the internal temperature in that space up five, six degrees, simply by that internal re-reflectance of heat. So issues of heat island, absolutely essential. Because you see, as the heat island, this is Tucson, Arizona. Every house in Arizona now, pe now has to cool significantly more. Simply, this is just because of the heat island effect. So heat island's important. And the trouble is, in the old days, we could throw cheap energy at it. But the peak oil issue is what's going to do for us, really. Um, in the old days here, the, we're just over the peak of oil production globally. And as each country comes on and produces um, it, and begins to decay, then that half of the world's, the trillion of oil in that half of the world begins to become the second half in which the slope is downward. So for instance, America peaked in its oil production in 72 and 
globally, we're just about over peak here too. So that means there's less and less oil in the world. And as global demand grows, and oil production, which could go down on any of these, and I'm going next week to Brussels to a conference on this, means the gap between demand and supply grows. And how much is it now at, for a litre of petrol at the, the petrol station? Three, 3.54. And so we have to design carefully for a world in which there will be very, very expensive fossil fuels. And this is a 2008 prediction where they said that by 2011 it'll be the $91 barrel. Last week it was $125. So we have to design for issues like that. This is America, which is so badly, has such terrible problems. This is what they call the end of suburbia, because people who live 30, 40 miles from the office can't afford to run their SUVs anymore. What happens to them? They don't pay their mortgage. They pay to get to work, they pay for health care, they don't pay their mortgage. And that's what happened in 2007, taking the world um, economy down with it. Yeah? So these are really big issues. And we have really big choices we have to make as a generation. I think not just as a generation, as a, not even a decade, in the next few years about what sort of cities we want to live in and how we design and build them. The one, I mean, my, what I see as being the great salvation is that you can generate as much energy as needed in the whole world with the sunshine from that amount of Saudi Arabia. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed here that in Turkey you don't like making money. Why hasn't every building in Turkey got a solar system on the roof? This is Japan. Um, Japan has very little fossil fuels, and it's going to have an e even less nuclear now, isn't it? But Japan has a huge capacity, and this is a, a plan from MIT for running um, electric motorcycles around the city, charged from on-roof photovoltaics. I mean, this, this is a no-brainer technology, so why haven't you all invested in it? Um, i tell you something, this is Freiburg in Germany, this is uh, Adelaide, this is De Zhou, where um, a friend of mine, Huan Ming, started a factory. He started that factory in 1995. He is now on Forbes' rich list, he's a billionaire, and he... Um, this is Solar Valley, and in the last 10 years, he's built, built this, an entire factory complex run on solar. And that's what some of it looks like, his solar conference center, solar hotels, solar um, cities. 95% of all the buildings in Dojo are run on solar, and we're just beginning the, the Dundee Solar City. And working with Juan Ming, he has imported, we're building a factory together, subsidized by Scottish and Southern Electricity because we want to turn one of our Scottish towns into the, the biggest solar city in Europe. And we have the vision and we now have the investment to make this happen. So that's in Scotland. What about Turkey? We've looked here at new paradigms for cities, Mazda. Um, I mean, one thing is that they cut the city right down. They're making it less peaky less vulnerable, less brittle. Um, because one thing is sure is that the fourth leg of the chair, this is outside the UN in Geneva, is the, chair, the leg that's not there is governance. Because I just want to, to really bring home this point that here we have Mayor Daly in Chicago saying every building has to be lead platinum. And yet we know that lead platinum has its faults. LEED has significant faults. In fact, in a 2008 study, these are the LEED platinums and goals that are be a, be below code, you know? Because LEED platinum had faults. You couldn't get LEED platinum or gold unless you had full central air conditioning. Well, that's ridiculous. In Britain, we have um, building regulations 
that say that you can pass the regulations with an ordinary office block in Britain if it's fully air conditioned, you fail if it's naturally ventilated. These are regulations written by SIBSI, the heating, cooling, ve ventilation and air conditioning industry. If we have building contracts where the building services engineers are paid according to how much equipment they put into building, what is the incentive to take equipment out of buildings? So what about thinking of the contract as one of the problems? And here we have this issue of apples and pears, which you brought up, you know? Here's an apple, here's a pear. How do we compare them? Um, this is the code for sustainable homes in Britain. Reduced heat fabric loss parameter, that's how good a building it is. You get 2.5 points. For a cycle rack, you get 2.5 points. And for provision of an energy efficient external light bulb, you get 2.5 points. You only need two of the three to pass. So what's the incentive to build a better building? You just put in an energy efficient external light bulb. We've been talking about Briam. This is a very famous London building, a leading design building. The Briam estimate, the design estimate, and this is how it works in reality because it's very different. The models don't work, and we know that. We can change a few characters, we can fudge a bit here and there. But these are serious issues, you know? We're talking about, because as you were saying, it's so complex, this is what Patrick was saying. Even a simple building is enormously complex. And you know, Andy Shepard at Arabs, I've seen plenty of low carbon designs, but hardly any low carbon buildings. Billboard us, keep it simple, follow it through, do it well, tune it up, work on it over time to get it better and better. Because you see, efficiency is a false god. And we were talking about the Turkish regulations earlier about which type of building you're talking about. Here is a big glass box, and this is the type of building. So you will be measured against typical. So you can take it down to good practice, and you're still emitting four times more than you would in an ordinary old heavyweight naturally ventilated office block in the center of old Istanbul. Because here you've got heavyweight naturally ventilated, deep plan 1960s naturally ventilated, standard air conditioned, and big prestige glass box. So you say, great, this is 30% more efficient than any other office of its type. But if you took that model as Patrick's doing now, and you crank it down, make it even better, put in zero carbon technologies, you get it down there. So what's so clever about achieving that? So don't believe in efficiency as the, the good God. A low carbon building, half the demand with good architecture, double the efficiency of every piece of equipment in it, half the carbon intensity, so put in building integrated renewables, heat pumps and all of that, and get a bit more with behavior and controls. It's easy to do, it's not rocket science. Um, here's a house I built in 1995 that has virtually no emissions, 24 kilowatt hours, of which half of that or more is, is generated from the integrated and passive solar. It's not rocket science. But I just want to give you this last lesson here. It's all about comfort. Because if you get a, an American traveler landing in a hotel in Istanbul, he will require the temperature to be down here. And yet we know that people outside in Turkey can be perfectly comfortable in 25, 28, 30, with a cool breeze off the Bosphorus. It can feel like paradise. And yet the standards have been written, again, by the air, condition, air conditioning uh, lobby largely, based on Fanger's predicted mean vote, PPD, PMV, um, saying that largely that people can only be comfortable within a very limited range of temperatures. We all know that's wrong. Why do we believe it? Because if you have to keep a building between 20 and 24 degrees centigrade or 20 and 22 over a year, how do you do it? There's only one way to do it, to air condition. But there is the alternative which is to see comfort as a self-regulating system in which people, like in that Bosphorus house, like the termites, open bits, close bits, 
change their clothes, adapt their working habits, adapt their working day, and the adaptive model of thermal comfort shows that people around the world, whatever temperature they occupy, these are comfort temperatures, and the mean temperature outside, it's a perfect fit. People normally occupy those temperatures that they feel comfortable, and if they don't feel comfortable, they change them. So here, you can be perfectly comfortable. I've lived in Baghdad for many years, and once looked at the thermometer after a very hot day, and it was 40, and I thought, this is bliss. You adapt to those temperatures you typically occupy, and if not, what do you do? You change your clothing, um, you take off clothes, you sweat more, you um, put a fan on, open a window, and so on. You open windows, you put the blinds down, you put heaters on in winter and so on in a self-regulating adaptive sim um, system. This is in SWAT in Pakistan. You wear your light summer clothing, your warm winter clothing. You sit closer to the fire or the open window. Um, and you choose how you deal with light, the way you put your tables, um, the way you live your life and your behavior. Um, because every different climate is going to require, and here we have a mean maximum temperature and a mean minimum temperature, and roughly, as Baruch Givoni would say, halfway between those, you can get a really well-behaved passive building to follow halfway between the two, yeah? And so this is the co adaptive comfort temperature, and so you can see that for many months of the year here, this is Jerusalem, I didn't have Istanbul, eight, nine, ten months of the year, you can run the building with no heating or cooling. So understanding. And this key issue of how you approach building design for comfort is absolutely essential. A typical building engineer will run a building, well, in the worst case, at one temperature, maybe 22, 23, all year. Um, some systems you'll change from winter to summer. ASHRAE 55 here, if you follow an ASHRAE 55 algorithm. But if you take the um, external mean, daily mean outdoor temperature, which is this one here, as we saw in some of Patrick's, and the running mean temperature, if you actually use an adaptive comfort algorithm, a comfort temperature one that says you can occupy cooler temperatures in winter and warmer temperatures in summer, just set an adaptive algorithm, even if it's a control building. You can open the windows and you can also probably save, if it's a fixed window building, over 50% of your running costs simply by changing your approach to comfort. So there's a quick win because ultimately in the world we're going into, we are going to have to have an A category of building, which is one that uses no fossil fuel. B, which is comfortable and uses fossil fuel for part of the year. And C is a building which is comfortable but uses fossil fuel energy all year. This is the exact opposite of what it is now. So you'd probably say that an A building might look like that in Zanzibar or Pakistan or old Istanbul. A B building would be with shades, with some cooling for the coldest, with natural ventilation, and a C building would look like that. That's the sort of buildings that the market will drop. And this is what I call dead building syndrome, is that you see it all around. In the old days, in the 60s, you used to start to see Oh no, sorry, in about 2000, you'd start to see these empty 60s towers, usually near the railway station, nobody in them. And now I look around Istanbul and all there's all these empty buildings. Sort of, which buildings are the investors going to drop first? That's what's got to drive markets and that, that's, is that the sort of building that takes huge amounts of energy to run that's going to be top of their list? And this is where I say adaptive architecture, 
architecture in which people who occupy the buildings become part of the solution is incredibly important. Is that your pa building, Patrick? Top one? No. Is it? Yeah. So which, which building, you know, if, if you've got a company and you wanted to go into a building and you wanted top prestige floor space, yeah? Which one would you rent in? I know which one I'd rent in. It's your buildings, it's your cities, and it's your country. The choices you make for the way forward for Turkish architecture are going to be very interesting. Don't forget, Turkey is not America, yeah? Americans are addicted to air conditioning, they're addicted to fixed windows. Turkey is not Britain. Turkey, Istanbul is one of the greatest cities in the world. It has a history unlike any other city in the world. It has a uniqueness. If I was to give you advice, I would say, take all your architecture students, take them back, teach them how the old masters, Sinan, the people who built these buildings, how do these complex, complex systems work? And through learning by experience, let them understand where they want to take it forward. My personal advice to you is open the windows, don't close the windows, because that is the first sign of a good building. Thank you very much. Değerli misafirlerimiz, bu yoğun günün sonuna geldik. Eko Design Konferansı 2011'de bizlerle birlikte olduğunuz için çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ana sponsorlarımız BASF, The Chemical Company ve Siemens ev aletlerine, inovasyon sponsorumuz Vitra Artema'ya, sponsorlarımız Autodesk ve Yutonga, alt sponsorlarımız Soyak, Tekfen, Emlak Geliştirme ve Velux'e, ve tüm iletişim sponsorlarımızla destekleyen kurumlara katkılarından ötürü teşekkürlerimizi sunuyoruz. Ve tabii ki siz değerli katılan e, misafirlerimize de çok teşekkür ediyor. Konuşmacılarımıza da ayrıca İstanbul'a geldikleri ve böyle bir konferansa bize de katkılarını sundukları için tekrar tekrar teşekkür ediyoruz. Eko Design Konferansı 2012'de görüşmek üzere diyorum. Herkese iyi akşamlar, teşekkürler.